Hello, and thanks for joining us today for this discussion during Autism Awareness Month. For those of you who may not be familiar with our organization, Grafton Integrated Health Network is a behavioral health provider partnering with individuals, families, and communities to deliver positive and measurable results for children, adolescents, and adults with autism and intellectual disability. Grafton has always been a resource for our community for children and adults with significant disabilities such as autism. As we prepare to celebrate 60 years of service, we've taken some time to look back at the contributions made by our, by our staff over the years. Grafton was the first residential educational program for individuals with autism in Virginia. In 1981, we opened our first group home for adolescents with autism. In the early 80s, we completed the first official statewide study of autism in Virginia, which was lauded as one of the best state studies in the nation. Our teams have been and continue to be the vanguard for helping individuals with autism. It's very heartening for us to see the increased understanding and acceptance of what it means to be on the autism spectrum. Today, we often take for granted that students on the spectrum will join their peers in mainstream classes, and many of these children will benefit greatly from that experience but some will not, and these individuals are the focus of today's conversation. My name is Scott Cedar, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Grafton. Joining me in this conversation are Stephanie Lambert, Program Clinician and Social Worker, Jessica Morris, the Clinical Administrator of our Richmond Services, Maggie Hashimzadeh, the Clinical Administrator of our Berryville Psychiatric Residential Treatment Facility, who's gonna start us off. Maggie, can you begin by talking about the population of individuals with aut autism served here at Grafton? I sure can. Thank you, Scott. Well, this is Autism Awareness Month. It is important to discuss that most often people served at Grafton are not only diagnosed with autism. Oftentimes, children and adults come into our care with a complex diagnostic history. Some of the common diagnoses, in addition to autism, are reactive attachment disorder and anxiety disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, bipolar, depression, or destructive mood dysregulation disorder. On some occasions, our clients have, have or show signs of schizophrenia or a personality disorder along with autism. Even though everyone served by Grafton has a diagnosis of some kind, the diagnosis alone is not the only reason they are at Grafton. Our clients are referred to us because they display at least one of nine behaviors. These behaviors are aggression, property destruction, self-injury, elopement, lack of safety awareness, inappropriate social behaviors, disruption, threats of harm to oneself or others, and significant psychological impairment. When the clinical teams review clients for acceptance, we are most interested in which of these behaviors they have been displaying. Questions are not only asked about the frequency, intensity, and duration of the behavior, but also about what services and interventions have or haven't worked in the past. Throughout the interview process with the client and their family, we are able to determine if we can meet the client's needs using the resources and skills that we have. To be honest, the process of figuring out who a person is and how we can respond to them is far more important for the client's treatment than what the person is diagnosed with. Often by the time a person is being referred to Grafton, their families have already utilized a number of resources in their community. Many placements similar to Grafton have denied a client due to the severity of their behavior. Therefore, people are looking for anyone with the expertise to serve their child. While our clients' needs are complex, we pride ourselves in the fact that we have an incredible amount of expertise across Grafton. We have psychiatrists, behavior analysts, licensed clinical social workers, licensed professional counselors, case managers, registered behavior technicians, and direct support professionals with a wide variety of education and experiences that contribute to the success of our clients. Collaboration is a cornerstone in how we serve our clients. Grafton provides clients with a safe environment structure, and a treatment team that is often different than services they, they have had in the past in order to address the client and the family's needs. Once the client is in Grafton's care, the family remains involved and the treatment team puts a great emphasis on teaching the client's family the strategies and techniques that have been successful. My colleagues are gonna go into in depth about Grafton's philosophies on trauma, strength-based treatment, family engagement, and our person-centered approach. I want to emphasize to you that we are treating people for who they are, regardless of their diagnosis. A person's diagnosis is simply a label, and this label can help us understand a person better, but no two people with autism or any other diagnosis are alike. Now, my colleague, Stephanie Lambert, is going to share a bit about Grafton's philosophies of comfort over control. Thanks, Maggie. When you think of therapeutic approaches that are commonly used throughout the field of behavioral health, 
How many can you name that consider it to be a failure on the treatment team's part if the client does not make progress? And how many can truly consider the why versus how the client must change to meet our notions of typical behavior? At Grafton, we're always working towards understanding the why behind our clients' behaviors. For 60 years, Grafton has been using trauma-informed approaches when working on identifying the why, which includes an emphasis on comfort and caring for the individual rather than gaining control of them. We see some challenging clients at Grafton, but just because they may be more challenging does not mean that they should be considered treatment resistant. It just means that we should be looking to use more proactive strategies to use in their treatment. To help best serve individuals and promote comfort versus control, we have identified five key areas that set the foundation for care. They are community, teaching, kindness, being a behavior detective, which I will speak on more in a minute, and assuming trauma. Using the community as a classroom is important at our level of care. Clients should work towards a sense of community, sense of comfort in their communities, which doesn't come easy, easily to all individuals. Clients need opportunities to access their community environment through preferred and educational outings. Their feeling of comfort in their communities can help them access resources and opportunities at the community level. A teaching environment is also important to offer learning opportunities for each client. Kindness, which is my favorite foundational area, is important in a comforting environment as well. Grafton emphasizes relationships first because of the impact that relationships can have on individuals. A client in crisis may not respond to specific interventions and protocols in that moment, but simply having a positive relationship can help and can be the most meaningful in a client, to a client in crisis. Being a behavior detective is something that all staff learn through training that helps them understand common factors that can lead to behaviors that are viewed as maladaptive. This training helps our staff get into the habit of considering the why of a behavior. And the final foundational area is the assumption of trauma. When looking at why individuals engage in certain behaviors, an all too common underlying factor is the experience of trauma. And with the experience of trauma comes the higher risk for re-traumatization, which individuals with autism and other complex diagnoses are 3.4 times more likely to experience. Grafton acknowledged this trend in our clients and developed a crisis intervention program using techniques to avoid the risk of trauma and re-traumatization with restraints. This program is called Ukuru, which is Japanese for receive, and is the first patent-pending crisis training program offering a physical alternative to restraints and seclusion. Ukuru techniques are based off of the importance of using comfort versus control techniques to help individuals in crisis. This technique avoids use of physical restraints by instead using verbal and nonverbal communication, as well as a series of interventions to de-escalate and manage physical aggression, as well as other high-risk behavioral events. Comfort versus control is, is important to consider when a client is in crisis, but comfort versus control is not only used during crisis with clients. Comfort versus control techniques can also be seen throughout the treatment and treatment planning process. Each piece of a client's treatment is based off of positive behavior supports and mental health interventions individualized to each client's needs, strengths, and preferences. We want clients to feel that their input is valued and acknowledged as much as possible, so they can feel a sense of comfort in their environment. You'd be surprised what clients can tell you about their own goals, needs, and treatments if you listen. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Jessica. Thanks, Stephanie. I'm gonna talk about the person-centered approach. When I meet a family or potential new student for the first time, I start with two simple questions. What do they like and what are they good at? Oftentimes I've found that family members are surprised by this or don't seem to expect those to be the first questions. They seem to be expect to be asked about what the behavior problems are. And some families have even said that nobody has ever asked those questions before. Ruth Birch, the founder of Grafton in 1958, used this person-centered approach before the term even existed. She knew instinctively to start where the person is. She used a strength-based perspective with what do they enjoy and what do they do well, and started to build programming around those things. And by programming, I mean implementing ways to teach and reinforce new abilities, including increasing skills, while addressing behaviors or clinical symptoms that interfere with the person reaching their maximum potential in the lowest level of care. Part of understanding a person's strengths, though, is also understanding their area of need. 
This includes assessing the existing skill sets, social skills, coping skills, life skills, and so on, and figure out how to use strengths and preferences to address any areas of potential growth. An individual's interest can be incorporated into teaching strategies. For example, one long-standing story about the early Ruth Birch days of Grafton describes a young student who was struggling with all aspects of learning. This child loved horses though, and Ruth knew this. So what did she do? She used horses as the center of every teaching moment, reading about horses, counting horses, learning to care for horses, and so forth. This strategy provided a motivation and sustainable interest for the child, a reason to learn. We set goals that are realistic, meaningful, and attainable for that person, goals that will improve their individual quality of life and not goals that come from a cookie cutter mold. Being person-centered also means that success is individualized. It looks different for everyone. Things that might be considered to be small achievements for some people equal amazing progress and success for others. Putting toothpaste on a toothbrush independently, grasping the concept of a picture icon representing an actual thing, a thing they like or want, a piece of candy, a toy, whatever it is. Every day is full of successes and being person-centered means recognizing and celebrating these whether that means mastering a new skill or mastering the first step towards a new skill, whether that means asking to take a break when they're frustrated or simply staying, simply staying safe. So at Grafton, we start with the person and all the qualities they bring and combine that approach with evidence-based practices and standardized assessments. These assessments are proven tools for identifying factors that impact an individual's quality of life. For example, the Assessment of Functional Living Skills, or AFLS, is used to track skill building and level of independence over a period of time. It also serves as a basic curriculum for teaching life skills, such as hygiene, to picking out the right clothes for the, clothes for the weather. Basically, from the initial assessment with the team, including the individual and family members, internal team members, we pick two to three skills as our primary focus areas. These would be the skills that would provide the most immediate impact for that person's independence in the world, whether that's toiling or caring for themselves if they get a cut. Working on mastering too many skills or making too many changes to current routines can be difficult for any person, as we all know. Supporting someone in feeling successful and having a sense of personal achievement are the real goals. Another example of an assessment we use here is the BPI, or Behavior Problems Inventory, and we use the short form here. This looks at the frequency and severity of self-injurious behaviors, aggression towards others, and stereotypy, which means repetitive behaviors or movements like hand flapping or self-stimming with string that may interfere with a person's progress or socialization. The goal is to decrease the frequency of these behaviors and thereby the total assessment score. These are just some of the behavior issues that might impact someone's personal progress. Some of these behaviors, like aggression, might be learned based on lifelong experiences or trauma. By teaching replacement skills and new ways to interact with the world, we are addressing and reducing unsafe behaviors. One more assessment I'll mention is the Developmental Profile 3, or DP3. This one is designed to assess a child's development on five scales physical, adaptive behavior, social, emotional, cognitive, and communication. A general development score is based on the performance on all five of these scales. This is a particularly useful assessment for children with severe disabilities who may not respond to other formal evaluation procedures or measures. And as we work to increase coping skills, communication skills, vocational skills, life skills, and functional behaviors, the development scores go up. As we embrace the person and teach to their individual strengths and needs, we see progress. So, while empirically proven assessments are undeniably valuable, it's the identification of each person's own goals and work that is the requisite component for success. And how do we make this work? By starting with the not so simple questions, what are they like and what are they good at? And that's what the person-centered approach is about. 
We take the data from a proven assessment model and then add the necessary ingredients of caring and respect for each individual for their own aspirations and personal potential, and we build from there. Now I'll hand the mic back to Stephanie, who will talk a bit about how Grafton closely collaborates with the families of individuals we serve. Thanks, Jessica. At Grafton, we focus treatment on the individual and their specific needs, but we also work to include family in as many ways as possible. We believe that including the family in the client's care is crucial to their current and long-term progress. Including families in treatment is something that has been a long-standing part of Grafton's work with our individuals. Families can be involved in many ways, from visits with their child or family members, to attending monthly meetings, as well as other meetings involving the care of their loved ones. There have been times that families have joined group homes on community outings to the store and learned different ways to help manage behaviors in those common community settings. Families, as well as non-relative caregivers involved with the client, are also offered services such as family therapy, ABA family training, and training on the Ukuru system that I mentioned earlier. I have been able to help with Ukuru family trainings and have seen how the information and techniques provided to the family have provided them with a sense of relief as well as a better understanding of their child. Training not only teaches interventions and responses to crisis behaviors, but also teaches parents and about the effects of trauma and gives them tools to also consider the why behind behaviors. The families that we work with often have their own histories to work through that can affect them as well as their child. Offering services, supports, and opportunities for learning and connections, such as Ukuru trainings, can help the families feel as though they are supported and have a safe place to share any difficulties that can come with caring for an individual with autism or other diagnoses. We as an organization and service provider want to work with families to help determine the best treatment path for our clients. It seems as though some providers view a family as an outside source that needs something done too by throwing services and information at them without acknowledging the family's thoughts and concerns. We want to respect each family's expertise as loved ones of the child and combine that with our expertise in services and clinical care to work towards the best outcome for our clients. Up until this point in the conversation, we've talked a lot about the philosophy behind Grafton's work with individuals with autism. But the best way to illustrate this is through our clients themselves. To that end, we wanted to share some of recent stories of progress. To begin, I wanted to share a story about a client who was in Berryville for several, for several years and transitioned down to the Richmond area as a step down. His parents received family therapy to help them better understand his diagnoses and prognosis. And he has a history of displaying significant behavioral incidents of aggression through, towards caregivers and staff. He, was got, he got to be transitioned home in November and continues here as a day student. His parents maintain good contact with us and he has been able to be at home successfully for almost six months, which was one of his personal goals during his entire time in residential treatment. And I'll hand it over to Maggie to share a success story as well. Thanks, Stephanie. My success story comes from a young lady who came to Berryville. She was on the autism spectrum. And when we read about her, we were pretty scared about her abilities to hurt herself and others. She was often restrained in her previous placements, and she had been placed in an acute hospital setting on multiple occasions. On the day of her admission, I didn't have the opportunity to meet her. So when I came to work the next morning and heard screaming and saw a couple of staff members around her with the Ukero blocking pads, I thought to myself, oh no, we didn't get a honeymoon period with this one. She's definitely gonna give us a run for our money. Um, I'm elated to say that that day was the only time that this client didn't have to go to school because she was engaging in such challenging behavior. She was never restrained in our care, and I don't ever recall seeing a staff member with it, using a blocking pad with her again. She was able to discharge to the care of her parents with new skills, and her family used the techniques that we were using with her to be successful in their home. I will pass it off to Jessica for a success story now. Thanks, Maggie. When I was thinking about particular clients and their success, one individual stood out in my mind, largely because of the first time we met and meeting with his parents. This young man, when he arrived here, was 18 years old and was not toilet trained yet. He was never in an out-of-home placement before, and his parents were older, and he was the only child. During our initial interview, his parents talked about their son in a way that was very overwhelming to me. 
the love they have for him and the nuances of every single part of his day that they were able to describe indicated to me how much they were handing over to us in the form of trust and placing him in our care. We worked with him and we did help him get toilet trained and increase his functional living skills and thereby we decreased his incidence of aggression and other property destruction and maladaptive behaviors. He eventually graduated from our school and moved on to an adult program and his parents were so pleased with what we had done for him and the trust that they had placed in us was worth it for them. And that was a story that made me feel very confident in what we do. And it's something that I remember every day. Now I'll pass it back to Scott. Thank you, Jessica, Stephanie, and Maggie. I can't tell you how proud I am to be part of this team listening to these stories and hearing you speak about the work you do every day. Um, it's clear that you're giving families and children their lives back. And thank you, most importantly, to everyone who took the time to listen to this discussion. I hope you found it of value. Of course, April is Autism Awareness Month, but at Grafton, and more likely for you too, so are the other 11 months of the year. So we hope to stay in touch with you in order to continue this conversation. You can find us online at Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and be sure to visit our website at www.grafton.org. If you have any questions for us regarding the data we've gathered, our clinical approach, uh, Ukuru systems, or any other part of what we do, please do not hesitate to reach out. Again, thank you for listening today, and we look forward to connecting again soon.